Okay, let's talk about Nathaniel Bacon and Bacon's Rebellion. Uh, it, again, as I said on the other video, it's hard to overstate the importance of Bacon's Rebellion. Uh, one historian calls it Civil War, the Civil War of Virginia. Um, it happens in 1676. And, and what we're going to read right now in Voices of Freedom is, is his manifesto, his, his proclamation to the people, where he outlines the grievances that he and his followers have uh, against the ruling aristocrats of, of Virginia. And, and that's really what it is. It's, it's a, it's a class-based uh, manifesto. It's, it's a rejection of the, of the authority figures in colonial Virginia at the time. So before we begin, let's talk again about the ABCs of, of deconstructing a, a historical source. And let's think about the audience. When, when Nathaniel Bacon is issuing this proclamation, obviously it's a public proclamation. It's intended to be, to be read uh, aloud in public settings. It's intended to be persuasive. He wants to win over, his, his, win over more supporters to his cause. Uh, so obviously he's not going to be, uh, you know, reasoned and well measured, and you know, he's not going to take into account necessarily the, the opponent's arguments or anything. He wants to to paint as stark a picture as possible for his readers to show just how despicable and corrupt Governor Berkeley and and the rest of the the colonial powers are. Uh, so, so it, you have to read it in that sense. It's a, it's a piece of, of propaganda, you know, intended to to sway uh, a reader to his cause. Uh, let's think about the bias. Where's where's Bacon coming from? Who is he? I mean, one thing that's interesting is is that he's going to lead a rebellion of mostly servants and and a fair number of slaves uh, against the ruling aristocracy. And yet he himself is a member of the aristocracy as well. Uh, he's uh, a relatively young man, late 20s, early 30s, uh, when, he, when he leads this rebellion. He's ambitious, uh, but he's out in the back country, right? He's on the outs in, in some ways. He uh, has a personal grudge against Governor Berkeley. He, uh, he feels like he is not part of, of Ber Berkeley's inner circle, and he resents that. Um, and he's not. You know, he's not in Jamestown. He didn't get land uh, close into Jamestown along the James River like, like uh, the wealthier, more powerful uh, uh, people do. He, he's, he's rich and he's wealthy and he's a landowner, but he's out in the boonies, right? He's out further west. Uh, and that, that is part of his, his, the fuel, what's fueling his fire here is that, that personal vendetta, that personal grudge. Um, and he combines it with what's going on in, in the 1670s along the western, in the, in the western backcountry of, of Virginia. And that's the scene, the context. Uh, you know, where does this come out, come from? Where, where, what's going on in the world when this document is, is produced? Um, and we talked a little bit about it in the other video, right? That, that in the, the mid-1600s, that economic opportunity, particularly for, for small farmers or, or indentured servants in Virginia, has basically dried up because most of the good land has been taken. I mean, if you think about it, it's been go colonization has been going on for several decades now, and and the the aristocrats have basically absorbed all the best land, all the all the land right along the the waterways. Uh, and so, if you're an indentured servant, you you serve out your term and you get your freedom dues and and you get land, that land is going to be further and further west. Well, who's out there further and further west? The Native Americans are out there. The, the Native Americans who've been pushed uh, off the coast and further, and further inland, they're still out there in the in the western area of Virginia. And so, when these indentured servants go into the back country, and at this time it's called the back country, and it's it's interesting. Just as an aside here, uh, English the English colonies in the in the 1600s and and 1700s are still oriented very much back toward England, right? The, you, you, you read about in the chapter how the elite uh, in particular model themselves after the English elite. They send their kids to school back in, in London. They build these huge um, plantation homes in the style uh, of the English aristocrats back in England. The dress, the clothes, the, the, uh, the food, the 
books that they read. These are all modeled on England because the society is still very much oriented toward the old world, toward England. All the, you know, all the exports go uh, back to England. And so the western part of the, of the English colonies is called the back country. Because if you think about it, if the front is facing England, then your back is to the west. Right, and so going out to the back country was really kind of a, a, a demotion, right? I mean, the only people who went out west are people who couldn't make it uh, in the in the coastal cities or in coastal areas or didn't have the land, right? So these are you know, newly freed indentured servants, maybe folks like Nathaniel Bacon who are on the outs from the from from the inner circle of aristocrats. So it, it's kind of, these backcountry folks are, you know, that's where you get the term, the hillbillies, right? You know, these are the folks who are, are less wealthy, um, live much more hard scrabble kind of lives, lives on the, on the backcountry. Later on in American history, after the revolution, right, we turn our back on England, right? And we, we start looking to the West, go West, young man, right? That, that, that's where our manifest destiny is. And so we call it the frontier because now, Everything is oriented to the West. We call it the frontier because that's the front part, our, our, our front porch of America. But in the 1600s, 1700s, it's still the backyard. It's way in the back country. So you've got all these indentured servants kind of pouring into, into Native American lands out West. And, of course, there's going to be conflict. Right? We see this time and time again. We see it in New England with the Pequots. We see it in, in Virginia here with the Pamunkeys and the Doegs and, and other uh, Indian tribes who don't particularly appreciate these new settlers coming in. There are all kinds of skirmishes, conflicts. Um, some settlers are killed. Indians are, are killed. Uh, and, and so the, there's a lot of anger boiling up uh, on the western on the western border, in this, in this land between the colonists and, and the Indian land. And these, the, uh, you know, these backcountry settlers are frustrated because the, the governing, governing authorities, Governor Berkeley, doesn't seem to want to do anything about it. Right? Governor Berkeley is interested in, in maintaining order in his colony. Right, he doesn't want constant warfare with the Indians. He doesn't want to to have to send troops out there to to quell these disturbances. He's got trading pacts, trading alliances with a lot of these tribes that have been worked out over the over the course of of previous decades. He doesn't want to disrupt those relationships. That's part of what's fueling the 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 prosperity of of the Virginia colony. And so he he sees the these backcountry settlers as as rabble rousers and troublemakers, right? Especially because they're they're coming from a very different class. Uh, and Berkeley recognizes. I mean, he he says you know there are six parts in seven uh, of, of the the Virginia populace that that's that's poor and and indebted. Uh, you know, six out of seven. You know, the vast majority of, of Virginians are are poor and, and are from this this servant class. And he doesn't want he, he's not interested in their priorities. He doesn't want them stirring up trouble on on the western border. And and so he basically ignores their their demands. You know, they they're growing frustrated. And Nathaniel Bacon, ironically perhaps, because he's an aristocrat himself. He, he sort of straps them on, you know, he, he brings them along with his personal grudges, and he, he comes to, to be the, the primary uh, leader of this, of this rebellion, of this revolt against the aristocrats, where he cobbles together this, this, uh, this, this army of, of, of servants, some slaves, uh, and, and just frustrated backcountry settlers who, who wanted want the governor to basically step in and wipe out the Indians so that so that they can have free access to this, this western land, which is the only land that's that's available to them. They resent the high taxes that they, they have to pay, which they see as enriching the, the tidewater planters and, and the governing elite, and they get frustrated. And so Bacon gives voice to these frustrations with his declaration to, to the people. All right, so... You have to bear bear with the the language here, right? I mean, it's it's the language of the the mid 1600s, and and so you gotta just stick with it. It's a it's a short document, but a powerful one that expresses the this frustration of uh, the lower classes in colonial Virginia. Um, 
So he starts off by talking about you with, Virtue be a sin, if piety be guilt, all the principles of morality, goodness, and justice be perverted, we must confess that those who are now called rebels may be in danger of those high imputations. Right? He's saying, you know, only in an inverted social order could we be considered sinful or, or guilty here. We are the ones in the right. Those loud and several bulls would affright innocence and render the deference of our brethren in the inquiry into our sad and heavy oppressions treason. Right? He's calling the, the, the folks, the, the governing authorities, bulls. You know, right? these, these are the bulls back there. They're calling us treasonous for just bringing to, to their attention these grievances that we have. But if there be, as sure there is, a just God to appeal to, if religion and justice be a sanctuary here, if to plead the cause of the oppressed is sincerely to aim at his majesty's honor and the public good without any reservation or by interest, if to stand in the gap after so much blood of our dear brethren bought and sold, if after the loss of a great part of his majesty's colony deserted and dispeopled freely with our lives and estates to endeavor to save the remainders be treason, then God Almighty judge and let guilty die. Right? This is rhetoric. This is rhetoric at its best. Right? He's bringing in God. Right, he's saying he, he he's saying if you know God, he's appealing to a just God, right? And he's saying if there is a religion, if there is just God, if you know if tr just trying to save our our homes and our families is treason, then we are treasonous, right? That that this is this is what we're doing here. We're we're trying to protect our Majesty's interest. But since we cannot in our hearts find one single spot of rebellion or treason, or that we have in any manner aimed at the subverting the settled government or attempting of the person of any either magistrate or private man, notwithstanding the several reproaches and threats of some who for sinister ends were disaffected to us and censured our honest and on, innocent and honest designs, right? He's, he's talking about people who've deserted him and gone to the other side, and he's and he's he's. He's, you know, he's trying to make the claim here that we are the, the, the righteous here. We are the good ones here. We are the innocent here. And since all people in all places where we have yet be, been can attest our civil, quiet, peaceable behavior, far different from that of rebellion and tumultuous persons, let truth be bold and all the world know the found, real foundations of pretended guilt. Right, so in this introduction, like he's he's kind of laying out like we are the righteous, we are fighting for good, we are we are not rebellious and tumultuous people. No, no, not at all. Right, he he says we're uh, we're we're peaceable, civil, quiet. Of course, we know that 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 they've been out in the backcountry killing Indians. Uh, these are not quite peaceable and, and civil uh, civil folks. But in his manifesto, of course, he's going to paint himself and his followers as the, as the most uh, benign people possible. Now, we appeal to the country itself, what and of what nature their oppressions have been, or by what cabal and mystery the designs of many of those whom we call great men have, may, have been transacted, transacted and carried on, right? Notice how he said, those whom we call great men, right? The so-called great men. Who are they? The governing authorities, right? Governor Berkeley. Right? He, 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 this is where he's starting to, to twist the knife a little bit in, into the, the side of the authorities. But let us trace these men in authority and favor to whose hands the dispensation of the country's wealth has been convit, committed. Right? Let's look at these folks. These folks we call great men. These folks who we've given all this land to, right? that we've entrusted with our wealth. And it's a funny way of putting it, right? They say, you know, these, these rich people who have all the money in the colony, who are profiting from, from our toil. Let's look at these folks a little bit, right? Let us observe the sudden rise of, of their estates compared with the quality in which they first entered the country or the reputation that they have held here amongst wise and discerning men, right? Look at how their estates have grown since they got here. And let us see whether their extractions and education have not been vile, and by what pretense of learning and virtue they could so soon come into employments of so great trust and consequence. Right? Again, he's going after these authorities. Hey, who are these people? How did, how did they get so wealthy? Let's examine their, their backgrounds, how, whether their extractions and educations have been vile. Right? 
these people are corrupt. He, 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 in this manifesto, he's telling them these people are corrupt. These folks that we call great are not so great. Let us consider their sudden advancement. And let us also consider whether any public work for our safety and defense or for the advancement and propagation of trade, liberal arts, or sciences is here extant in any way adequate to our vast charge. Right? Look at how wealthy they've gotten. And what have they done for the people? Nothing. Have they done anything for our safety and defense? No, they haven't done anything. But they're getting rich. Now, let us compare these things together and see what sponges have sucked up the public treasure. <laughs> right? That's pretty harsh stuff. Right? He's calling them basically, they're, the, they're leeches on society. The, the, these aristocrats are the ones who, who are sucking up the, the, the public wealth. And whether it has not been privately contrived away by unworthy favorites and juggling parasites whose tottering fortunes have been repaired and supported at the public charge. Right? And this is where his own personal uh, anger comes through. Right? I mean, he calls them unworthy favorites. Right? The people who are favored by the colonial elites, who, who go and, and are, are given huge tracts of, of great land. Right? These, are, these are parasites on our society. Right? That, that they're tottering fortunes. Right? They, they make all these bad decisions. They're not good businessmen. They, they're, their fortunes are, are jeopardized. And who comes in to, to pay the bill? The people, the, the, the colony, right? at public charge. I mean, I hear echoes of, of uh, you know, 2008. Right? The economy's collapsing. And who's to blame? The aristocrats, these favored few who got super wealthy and, and then make all these terrible decisions, things start collapsing, and the public steps in to bail them out, right? I mean, you, you can hear in Bacon's Rebellion echoes of, of resentment, the, the, what becomes the Tea Party resentment of the, of the early 2000s, right? This wealthy favorites of the, of the colony. Now, if it be so... Judge what greater guilt can be than to offer to pry into these and to unriddle the mysterious wiles of a powerful cabal. Let all people judge what can be of more dangerous import than to suspect the so long safe proceedings of some of our grandees, and whether people may with safety open their eyes in so nice a concern. Right? Open your eyes, people. Look at, at your leaders. They're corrupt. That's what he's, he's trying to get through to the, to the readers of this, of this manifesto, right? We, we have rot in, in Jamestown, right? These, these grandees have corrupted the entire promise of, of America. We have to root them out. Another main article of our guilt is our open and manifest aversion of all, not only the foreign, but the protected and darling Indians, right? The protected and darling Indians. He's accusing the, the governing authorities of protecting their, you know, the, the, their darlings, these Indians out on the, on the western border, right? And that, this comes at the expense of the, the white settlers who want to live there. This, we are informed, is rebellion of a deep dye for, both, for that both the governor and council are bound to defend the queen and the Appomattox with their blood. The Appomattox are a, are a tribe later uh, a, a town in Virginia where the Civil War uh, ends. But he's saying that, that the governing authority is, is beholden to two masters. One is the queen, that they, they do the queen's bidding, and the other are the Indians, right? They're, they're so fearful of the Indians, they do the Indians' bidding too. Well, who gets left out of the process? Who gets, get, gets left out of that are the, the, the poor whites, the white settlers who are, who are supporting Bacon and his rebellion. And Black slaves, although they, they, he's not talking about them in, in, at this point, but black slaves hear this language, and they agree, right? and they start flocking to Bacon's rebellion as well. Now, whereas we do declare and can prove that they, that they have been for these many years enemies to the king and country, robbers and thieves and invaders of his majesty's right and our interest in the states, but yet have by persons in authority been defended and protected even against his majesty's loyal subjects and that in so high a nature that even the complaints and oaths of his majesty's most loyal subjects in a lawful manner proffered by them against those barbarous outlaws have been by the right honorable governor rejected and the delinquents from his presence dismissed 
not only with pardon and indemnity, but with all encouragement and favor. Right? He's saying, look, we've tried to be go th be peaceful and go through civil means to, to express our frustration. We've gone through you know, a most lawful manner. We, we've, we've talked about what's going on in, in our, our backcountry settlements, and the governor has ignored us and rejected us and dismissed us. Right? They have firearms so destructful to us and by our laws prohibited, commanded to be restored to them. Right? And so... In the, the backcountry settlements, they, they've not allowed Indians to carry any weaponry at all. And they've complained to the governor. And what does the governor do? He goes and he gives the arms back to the Indians. right? Because again, the governor is interested in promoting trade with, with his Indian allies. He doesn't want to start up any, any wars with them. And by our laws, we're commanded to be restored to them an open declaration before witness made that they must have ammunition, although directly contrary to our laws. Again, he, they're, they're angry with the, the governing authorities. And that anger expresses itself against the Indians because the Indians are right there. The authorities are, are way back east in Jamestown. Now, what greater guilt can be then to oppose and endeavor the, the destruction of these honest, quiet neighbors of ours, right? He's, making, he's, he's being satirical here. He's saying, oh yes, these honest, quiet neighbors of ours. They're not honest and quiet. He's going to accuse these Indians of being barbarous, right? Another main article of our guilt is our design not only to ruin and extirpate all Indians in general, right? We're accused of wanting to wipe all, out all the Indians but all manner of trade and commerce with them. Judge who can be innocent that strike at this, this tender eye of interest. Since the, right honorable, since the right honorable the governor hath been pleased by his commission to warrant this trade, who dare oppose it? Or opposing it can be innocent. Right? He's, he's saying, look, the governor is all about trade. That's all he's interested in. And we're, because we are, are angry by by what's going on, by, by Indians coming in and attacking our settlements, we're somehow attacking the crown and attacking the governor, you know, the, the, the colony itself, because we're, we're against this trait. We're not against this trait. We, we want the governor to step in and protect us from, from these Native Americans who are, who are attacking us. Again, this is his perspective. And the perspective of many white settlers on the, on the border. Although plantations be deserted, the blood of our dear brethren spilled, on all sides our complaints, continually murder upon murder renewed upon us. Right? He's going, this is what the Indians are doing. right? They're, they're attacking us. They're murdering us. You know, our plantations are now deserted because of them. Who may, dare or may or dare think of the general subversion of all manner of trade and commerce with our enemies who can, who can or dare impeach any of, any of traders at the heads of the rivers? Right? This trade is, is benefiting people at the heads of the rivers, right? Down, down river, down in Jamestown, uh, but not us. If contrary to the wholesome provision made by laws for the country's safety, they dare continue their illegal practices and dare asperse the right honorable governor's wisdom and justice so highly to pretend to have his warrant or break that law which he himself made. Who dare say that these men at the heads of the rivers buy and sell our blood and do still, notwithstanding the late act made to the contrary, admit Indians painted and continue to commerce. Although these things can be proved, yet who dare be so guilty as to do it? Right? So the, he's expressing anger at the Indians, he's expressing anger at the traders who trade with them, and that they, they put a higher priority on that trade than on the safety of the, the white settlers. So now, with all these grievances, here's our declaration, the declaration of the, of the people. For having, upon specious pretenses of public works, raised unjust taxes upon the community, the commonality, for the advancement of private favorites and other sinister ends, but no visible effects in any measure adequate. Right. So here's one problem that, that we have these unjust taxes that we, the settlers, are paying to advance their fortunes. For not having during the long time of his government in any measure advanced this hopeful colony, either by fortification or towns or trade. He's saying Governor Berkeley's done nothing. For having abused and rendered contemptible the majesty of justice, of advancing to places of judica jud judicature, scandalous and ignorant favorites. Again, he hates these, these people who've been favored 
over him, right? He's angry because he hasn't been favored. For having wronged his majesty's prerogative and interest by assuming the monopoly of the beaver trade, by having in that unjust gain bartered and sold his majesty's country and the lives of his loyal subjects to the barbarous heathen, of course, those are the Native Americans in his view, for having protected, favored, and emboldened the Indians against his majesty's most loyal subjects, talking about himself and his followers, of course, never contriving, requiring, or appointing any due or proper means of satisfaction for their many invasions, murders, and robberies committed upon it. Right? So, so he's laying out the case. For having the second time attempted the same, thereby calling down our forces from the defense of the frontiers and most weak exposed places for the prevention of civil mischief and ruin amongst ourselves, whilst the barbarous enemy in all places did invade, murder, and spoil us, his majesty's most, most faithful subjects. Of these, the aforesaid articles, we accuse Sir William Berkeley. I mean, this is bold stuff, right? I mean, he's, he's going up against the, the governor and the, and the authorities of the colony with this proclamation of the people. As guilty of each and every one of the same, and as one who has traitorously attempted, violated, and injured his majesty's interest here by the loss of a great part of his colony and many of his faithful and loyal subjects by him betrayed and in a barbarous and shameful manner exposed to the incursions and murders of the heathen. Right? He is to blame, not only for, for these unjust taxes and, and for exploiting the, the settlers, but for exposing them to danger and not doing anything about it. And we do further man, demand that this said Sir William Berkeley be forthwith delivered up. Give us, give us him to him. Yeah, give him to us. Right? We want him. Within four days after the notice hereof, or otherwise we declare as followeth, that in whatsoever house, place, or ship he shall reside, be hid, or protected, we do declare that the owners, masters, or inhabitants of the said places to be confederates and traitors to the people, and the estates of them, as also of the aforesaid persons, to be confiscated. This we, the commons of Virginia, right, he's talking about the common people, the, the six parts of seven, right, the, the majority of the people, do declare desiring a prime union amongst ourselves that we may jointly and with one accord defend ourselves against the common enemy. Right? I mean, this is, this is as threatening as you can get. Give us the governor. And if you don't, anyone who hides him or protects him or helps him, you will be considered a traitor. We're coming after you too. And he does. He gets a, a hundreds and hundreds of followers together. They march on to Jamestown. They burn it to the ground. Governor Berkeley takes off running. Um, you know, go, you know, starts pleading with with the authorities back in London. He needs help, um, and I mean this this is civil war. I mean this is as as powerful a rebellion as, as you're going to see in the in the 1600s. The governor is able to to bring the weight and power of the royal army back uh, with him back into Jamestown and march back in. Bacon dies of, of dysentery uh, himself. It, when Bacon dies, you know, the, 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 the rebellion loses a lot, of its, uh, a lot of its momentum, a lot of its steam. Berkeley's able to come in with the, the authorities, with the army, quash the rebellion, and, and corrals the rest of the, the supporters, uh, Bacon supporters, hangs a few dozen of them, uh, and the rebellion is, is crushed. Uh, the last, the last group of holdouts is actually a group of, of eighty black slaves and twenty white English servants who refused to give up arms uh, for a long time. They were kind of holed up, and and so the rebellion is crushed, and and the, the colonial authorities uh, win, and and Bacon is dead. But but Bacon's rebellion has long, long term significance for for American history, not just for Virginia history. Because it struck so much fear into the heart of the upper class. I mean, what, what's happening in Virginia is, is you're, you're, you're getting a much a, a class-based society uh, similar to what people knew back in England. Right? You have this very wealthy landed elite controlling and dominating political affairs. But Bacon's Rebellion throws that into question. It says, well, what happens if, if the majority of the, the common people get together and, and try to overthrow the government? What happens if they then get together even with, with black slaves? What if we, because Bacon was offering freedom to slaves who joined his cause, right? And so black slaves are like, well, hell yes, I, we want to join you. And, and so the, the elites in Virginia are, are stunned and scared. Because that's a powerful alliance. If, if poor whites 
the, the common people get together, and particularly if they make alliances with, with poor blacks, they have the, the numbers, they could have potentially the force to overthrow the entire political system uh, and, and create what, what was called leveling. Right? And that's what some of the governors and uh, governor, people in the governor's council uh, called it. They said they're interested in leveling. And as we, we talked about the levelers before, you know, the levelers called for essentially small d democracy, right? where everybody has a say in, in the government. And so what the, the, in response, you know, yes, they, they quashed the rebellion, they hanged some of the, the leaders, Bacon's already dead, but in the years that follow, what, what happens is not only does the governor uh, and, and the, do the ruling authorities become more aggressive about their Indian policy and sort of taking the initiative to, to, to basically exterminate Indian, you know, kill Indians anywhere in their territories and push them away so that, so that colonists have free access to the land. But it, there's, there's a more subtle uh, development that happens. And, it, and, and what, it's why Bacon's Rebellion is part of this acceleration to, in, in the turn to race-based slavery, right? Because who are these people who are causing the problems? Well, they're the former indentured servants who now become small landowners. Uh, and here they are, you know, they're, they're joining forces with, with other servants, with slaves. This, this, is a, this is a powerful group. We need to break this group up. If we create a, a labor system, a race-based slavery, it's a system of slavery, then what that creates is it, it creates a permanent lower class in, in British America, right? And, and so any resentment of, of the elites can be channeled toward that lower class, right? And so, so you know, these are, are people who, who see, the, the elites who see uh, society as being naturally hierarchical, that there's always going to be a lower class, a poor, and then uh, an upper class that dominates, and then, then the, you know, the, the, the middle class in between. They didn't want to create this mass of white poor as, we, as they had back in England, right? So instead, if you create a mass of, of lower class back, a permanent underclass, then you can, you can have race-based alliances, cross-class alliances between the elites and, and small white landowners. And you can you can forestall you can you can prevent any kind of alliances happening between those folks and the slaves, right? So this helps to accelerate the transition to to race based slavery. Again, it's not like one person sort of sitting back, sits back and says, "Ah, oh, okay, here's what we got to do. We got to you know uh, buy black slaves. Then we won't have these these class based alliances anymore because we'll have this this permanent underclass." It doesn't happen that way. It's a shift that happens over the last couple decades of the of the 1600s. Bacon's Rebellion plays a, a big role in it because it scares the white leadership, um, it, it, it frightens them into into paying much more attention to the concerns of of the common white folks. Um, so it's tremendously important. And that's your your last question for for the homework is question number five, is how. Explain Bacon's Rebellion, and how does this help accelerate the turn to race-based slavery in America? And we'll talk about that more in class.